Hi, it's Dre Griggs with Obsidian Wisdom. Today we answer the question, why does saving for retirement feel impossible? The ability for us to retire and stop trading our time for money is what we all seek. We all want to have the freedom and flexibility to be able to make our own choices, to do things that we want to do when we want to do it for whatever reason we can think of in that moment. And even though it's something that each of us feel deep down is something that we deserve and we owe, and, and when you really think about it, it just it just feels natural. It feels natural to be able to do what I want to be able to do. And in many ways, it's something that we're all striving for. But for some reason, it feels like the system is designed to do the opposite, that the system is designed to take away our freedoms, that the system is designed to make lifelong employees out of us. And for many of us, the moment we realize that there is this thing called financial freedom, that there is this thing called retirement, we are then working for years, if not decades, to achieve that goal. And it's very elusive. It's pretty hard. And I will share with you some of the difficulties that I have had when it comes to my own retirement savings. And these may be ones that you have as well. The number one reason people feel it's difficult to save for retirement, almost impossible to save the amount of money that they need to maintain their lifestyle without them having to actively work for their money is the income constraints. The idea of us being able to set aside 20% of our income for our retirement is really hard for most people. Most of us were sitting there thinking, I'm just trying to pay the bills I have today. Maybe I don't make enough money to be able to put the money aside for retirement because I really do want to achieve financial freedom, but this is really hard for me. And if you have a family, then your, your kids, you're trying to figure out, should I put the money aside for my retirement or, or should I enroll my kid in gymnastics class? Should I put my money away for retirement or should I take my family on a vacation this year? Because they're going to grow up and they're going to leave and, and I don't want them to feel that I took them for granted. I don't want them to miss out on these different experiences and opportunities where in my mind, my kids are sitting amongst their friends and they're all sharing the things that they did over the summer. And my kid's like, yeah, we didn't really get to do anything. And, and while we know that that's not exactly how it would go, it doesn't change that feeling of guilt that we have where I don't know if I can do everything. And most of us as parents or caregivers or guardians, we decide that if I have to sacrifice something that I'm going to sacrifice my retirement funds, I'm going to focus on my kids. I'm going to take them places, give them amazing experiences, and maybe hopefully wishing I'll be able to make up for this in the end. Maybe when my kids are gone, I'll be able to allocate my money in a more effective way where maybe I can have my cake and eat it too. I know that this is a thought process that many of you have because this is the thought process that I have where I don't want to feel selfish with my money, that I am here to take care of my kids. I'm here to raise them. I want to create amazing experiences where, for example, my kids were asking for a dog and we ended up getting a dog and then they started asking for a cat. And now we have a cat too, because I don't want my kids to grow up and, and get a cat. And in my mind, they're telling their friends or their own kids or something like that, where they're like, this is the first cat I've ever had. And I'm like, oh, well, why is that? Because I know you love cats, right? I'm like, well, you know, my dad wouldn't get me one when I was younger. Right? Like, that's just something that I struggle with. It's something that I'm working on, but I'm just being transparent with you guys. That's something that I struggle with. And because of these immediate choices that we're making and the guilt that we may feel allocating our money towards our retirement, we often feel, well, retirement is so far down the line. I'm sure I can make up for that later. Number two on our list is rising costs. If you've been anywhere except under a rug, you know that inflation is a real thing. That you've seen over the past few years of the cost of everything has gone up. And it's gone up a lot. Everything from the price of a house to automobiles to the food to the energy, the cost is going up, up, up. And it is something that makes it hard for us to be able to set money aside. We just like a little bit of certainty, not too much certainty that life is boring, but not too spontaneous where we feel like we're literally living in a roller coaster. I know for me that I went to the grocery store and, and I was just getting some milk. And I noticed that a gallon of organic milk was almost $10. And I'm sitting here and I'm like, well, I just was reading that the Fed felt like they had gotten inflation under control and they had held the rates flat. Where they didn't raise them anymore, they felt that inflation was under control. In fact, I read some articles that were saying that we're thinking about lowering the interest rates because inflation is so under control that we're worried that we may go into a recession. But for me, someone who just went to the grocery store and saw a gallon of organic milk for $10, it doesn't really feel like we have the cost under control. And again, it comes back to that feeling that the system is designed to make lifelong employees, where our wages don't seem to go up with the cost of everything else, where it just feels like our wages are, are kind of over here and separate, and while the cost of everything else seems to go up a lot. And then one of the avenues that we had to get out of this hole, where you go to college, well, now the cost of college goes up. It goes up higher than the cost of food and energy and everything else. 
where every single year the price of college is going up 6%, 6% increase. Well, most wages are only going to go up 2 to 3% every single year. So we're going in the hole every year when it comes to college. Now, mathematically, the numbers still make sense as far as going to college, depending on the degree that you're going to get. There's a lot of degrees where it makes sense still. And a good rule of thumb used to be whatever my annual salary is when I first get out of school, that should cover the entire amount of my college expenses. Now, we don't expect you to allocate 100% of your salary towards your college expenses, but it's just a good ratio where the investment that you're making is a return on that investment. Now, that number is becoming a little bit more difficult, but depending on the type of degree you get, it still makes sense. But there used to be a time that every degree, it almost didn't matter what you went to school for. It just made financial sense to be able to get a degree. Number three on our list is the debt burden. And that's a very fancy way of saying that a lot of our money is being used inefficiently because we have to allocate it towards previous decisions that maybe were less than stellar. And if you haven't already noticed, I believe that saving for retirement feels impossible because there is this conditioning that's self-destructive where we naturally make decisions based off of the system and how it was designed to make lifelong employees that sometimes the hole that we're in is very difficult to climb out of. And I would say that that's literally the number one goal of the system. The number one goal of the system is for you to realize that retirement is the goal that all of us should have, which is the ability for us to purchase all of our time back where we don't have to trade our time for any money, that our money makes the money and then our time is spent on fulfillment and happiness. Oh, what a beautiful way to live our life. But along the way, the system will find ways to trip us up, whether that is controlling our wages or controlling the cost of living. And sometimes it's controlling the debt that we have. We just talked about the debt that many of us take all when we graduate from college, but we haven't talked about just the overall way that the system from the advertising and the commercials and things that we watch on TV, where we start spending our money on things that we were told will bring us happiness, where you buy the cars and the house, with the white picket fence, where you need to take a year off and take that backpack trip before you start college or before you start your career. All these are tools that are going to put us further in debt. And while we may feel good in the moment, I know at least for me, I began to realize that the strings tied to this experience was too expensive for me. That while I enjoyed the trips, knowing that I have to spend three times as long paying that trip back was something that would bother me, where I may take a trip that lasts one week and it may take me three months to pay it back. That math was a math thing for me, but I'd already made several of those decisions and put myself in the hole. Where the thing was, I had already made several less than stellar decisions and the cost just kept adding on. Every decision I made, it seemed like it added another three, six months, a year to where my money was tied up in something that was keeping me from investing in my retirement. Every car was another five to seven years of payments. When you get a house or you replace an oven, it's another three to five years of payments. I mean, your house is obviously more than that, but this is just prolonging our ability to save for our retirement. And even when you take trips where it's like, oh, this trip, I'm going to put on a card. I'm going to pay it off immediately before any of the interest catches on. But you and I know, and so do the credit card companies, that's just not very likely. And so as we get debt, that just is a very inefficient way to allocate our money, where 30, 40% of your salary is going towards paying off old bills. That means that we can't put the money towards our future because we're spending it on our past. Number four on our list is unexpected expenses. Let me tell you a quick example of this. I remember I put a plan together and I had this 2011 Toyota Highlander and it was a great vehicle. I drove it until it literally stopped. And my plan was, I'm gonna pay off this vehicle. As soon as I pay off this vehicle, I'm gonna then put that $300 towards my other debt. And then as I do the snowball effect, I'm gonna get out of debt. Well, the problem was the system already knew that. And so as soon as I got out of my debt, as soon as I started putting money towards my other debt so I can get that snowball effect, my car stopped working. I turned it on, it would not move. It would just make a click sound, it wouldn't turn over. Took it to a mechanic and he was like, dude, this would cost more than the car is worth. I remember being like, no way, I just got here, I just paid it off, how could this happen? It's called planned obsolescence and it's just as it sounds. They design things to go bad quicker than it used to. I remember first hearing this term in an old Lupe Fiasco song that I listened to back when I was in college, and it was something that I was like, okay, I don't really know what that is, but it sounds good. Well, my first experience with playing obsolescence, at least that I was aware of, was when I was a kid playing baseball. So the baseball bat has like a one-year warranty on it, and if your bat is dented, you're not allowed to use it in the game because it 
it's seen as a competitive advantage, right? The idea of a round bat hitting a round ball is sort of hard, but the idea of a flat bat hitting a round ball, well, that's a little bit easier. So the umpires would check your bat before every game. And wouldn't you know, around the time that your warranty just expired, it would seem that your bat would get a dent in it. If your bat got a dent before the warranty was up, you could just mail it back to them and they'll send you a new bat. It was like they knew exactly when to end the warranty. Obviously, you get a little bit older and you realize that they do. They knew exactly when to end the warranty. Well, fast forward to my late 20s, I was helping my in-laws and they had a new dishwasher. And the old dishwasher was heavy and it was bulky and it was really hard to take out. And that was my first experience with a dishwasher. So then when I went to put in the new dishwasher, I assumed it'd be the same struggle, the same burden, and the same difficulty. The new dishwasher felt like it was a third of the weight of the old dishwasher. The old dishwasher was made in a way that it would never break. And the new dishwashers with cheaper parts, more plastic, lighter, more fiber, that it's not made out of the steel in the same material that the old ones were. And now as a result, your new dishwasher just generally doesn't last as long. This is planned obsolescence. These are unexpected expenses. These are sometimes things where we're planning, like I'm gonna be able to keep driving my vehicle and I'm not gonna get rid of it. And then it just kind of dies on you. And you're like, man, that messes up the plan. Now I have to go back and get a new car payment, which then puts me back in the cycle of another five years of my money being poorly allocated. Now, sometimes it could be healthcare related things. Sometimes it could be family emergencies where it didn't happen to us, but it was someone that we knew. It could be anything. But we find that if we haven't already prepared for such an emergency, that it's going to pop up. And they always do which sometimes can make saving for retirement feel impossible. Number five is the lack of financial literacy, where we look back and we're like, man, if I could have invested my money in this, if I could have kept myself from buying that, then I would be in a completely different situation. And I often describe this as wisdom. And wisdom, when you look at it in the Bible, is described as insight. What is the insight that we get? Well, when you read the Bible and you look at King Solomon and him being granted wisdom, the way I interpreted that, understanding the word means insight, is God gave him the wisdom of a king who had been on the throne for 50 to 100 years, right? I think we would all agree that if you are someone who's new in a company, new in a position, who might have the knowledge, the book smarts, but you don't have the wisdom and practical experience, that you're probably not going to be as great as the person who had been there for 10, 20 years, knows all the ins and outs, knows everybody to call, knows what to do when this thing breaks because it's broken five times on them. They have the wisdom. There's only so much knowledge that we can get. There's only so much we could read and understand without having actually experienced the events firsthand. Sometimes the financial literacy, while we think it's just getting the information where I should invest here, I should invest this percentage, I should take my money here, it doesn't really compare to the wisdom, the actually living through some of these experiences, the insights, the nuances that we gain where when we look back, we're like, man, I would do things slightly differently. And we know that it would have been exponentially better because we had lived through it, we had seen what happened, and we know a little bit better. That's part of the reason I make the videos for you guys is not just so I can share the knowledge because the knowledge is everywhere, but it's also to be able to share the insight and the wisdom of the people who have retired. It's part of the reason I selfishly tend to focus on people with their retirement planning because as we get older, the wisdom, the richness of experiences that my clients even share with me is something that is priceless. It's something that you really can't describe when people tell you stories and experiences that they have. And then I'm thinking about me and my family and my life where it's, it's something that I, I don't take for granted, right? It's something that you just, you just learn to appreciate when you, when you're able to hear and experience certain things, there's an African proverb and the way it describes it, it says is whenever an elder dies, it's as if a library burns to the ground, which is a very strong visual, but that is the richness that I believe wisdom and insight that we gain through experience and time is something that we really shouldn't take for granted. We shouldn't be hard on ourselves because we don't have the same financial know-how as someone who has lived through something, but we should do better than we did yesterday, right? That's my only rule. Just do better than I was yesterday. And if I could be a little bit better each day, I feel like I'll be a pretty amazing person when it's all said and done. Number six in our list is employer benefits. If you don't have things like a match or, or different healthcare benefits or, or retirement planning options at your employer, that sometimes can put us behind the eight ball where instead of me being able to invest $100 and my employer literally matches that and gives me $100, which is 100% return on my investment, if you don't have access to that, then your money isn't going to be able to grow as efficiently and quickly. 
And for many people, they are unaware that they can open their own IRA, that they can open their own Roth, that they can create their own retirement plans. And they just assume because they don't have access to it through their work. And because the most common investment instrument people use for their retirement is their 401k, and you only get access to that through your employer, most people, if they don't have access to a 401k or their employer doesn't offer their retirement benefits, they're just not really sure where to invest their money. And when you combine the fact that you don't get the free money of a match, and then you don't also have the efficient investments because you're just not sure what to do with your money, it can really put you behind the eight ball and have a feeling as if saving for retirement is impossible. Number seven on our list is just economic uncertainty. You can put this under volatility, you can put this under recession, you can put this under a, a fad or a meme stock, however you want to describe it. It's I put my money in something and that investment doesn't work out and I end up losing a significant amount of it. The way that you would often look at this is when we talk about compounding interest, the beauty of compounding interest is that it works for you if you know about it and it works against you if you don't. We talked about how it works against you when it comes to debt, where it's very hard to get out of debt sometimes, but it can work for you when it comes to retirement planning and achieving financial freedom. Well, the number one requirement of you being able to compound your money is you can't lose it. And so you have to have investment strategies that are catered for long-term investing. And there are people, when I talk to them about their risk tolerance, we'll have a conversation and they'll be like, yeah, well, I have some crypto here. I have some Bitcoin there. And I'm sitting here like, well, wait, wait, what, wait, what for, for retirement? They're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I haven't. And they'll go through these different investments. And in my mind, I'm like, even if it works for six months or even a year or even five, you need something that works for 30 years. You need something that works for 20 years. You need something that works for 80 years, or you need something that works for a pretty long time. And the biggest concern that I see when it comes to short-term investment strategies, at least for me, really has to do with someone's risk appetite. And what that normally means is you're going to have peaks and valleys whenever you're doing short-term investing, where you may have a strategy that gets you 30, 40, 50% one year, but then you may lose 30, 40, 50% the next year. And the reality is the average person is going to double, triple, quadruple down on their investments on the year that they make 50%. But then the next year when they lose 40%, what do you think they're going to do? They're going to try to sell everything. And so mathematically, if you think about it, right, you, let's say you put $10,000 in and then you had a 100% return. So that 10,000 turned to 20,000. Well, now you said, okay, I'm going to put another $10,000 in then because I just had the best year ever. Great. So now you have $30,000 in your investment fund. Not bad after one year. $10,000 was created, $20,000 was put in. Well, the next year, the stock market goes down 50%. So now you have $15,000 in your account. What do you think the average person is going to do with a short-term investment strategy? And you're right. The average person is going to sell. So you put in $20,000 and you sold at $15,000. So you lost $5,000. We haven't even talked about the fact that you actually gained $10,000, so you actually lost $15,000. And that is the issue with short-term investment strategies. A short-term investment strategy, you know deep down that this wasn't going to last forever. And because you knew it wasn't going to last forever, the moment that things start crashing, you're like, I guess that was it. The ride's over. Let me go ahead and cash in my chips because that's gambling and not investing. There aren't many people that I personally know, and you may know them, that have a long-term view of cryptocurrency or Bitcoin and these different companies, everyone's saying, I'm basically waiting for it to get to a dollar. But then when you ask them when that is or why that is, and they're just like, well, I don't really know why or when it's gonna happen. I just know that if it happens, then I'm gonna make a lot of money. The thing about ifs, or at least the way I've heard it that always made me laugh, and I laugh at corny jokes, is if my aunt had an Adam's apple, she'd be my uncle, right? And you probably aren't allowed to say that anymore, and I don't, I don't mean any harm by it. But that's the thing about ifs. Yes, if means everything and anything is possible, but is it likely? Is it probable? It's possible, but is it probable? Unfortunately, for a lot of these assets, it's really hard to see the long-term value so that we can properly calculate and gauge what the return and the risk is. Number eight on our list is procrastination. I have another video I did it a long time ago and people liked it a lot, but I talked about the six types of procrastinations. And it is just the idea that each of us procrastinate and we procrastinate in a variety of ways for a variety of reasons, which isn't very surprising. I'm someone who procrastinates on perfectionism where I feel like I can make this a little bit better, a little bit better, a little bit better. Go back to the lab, go back to the shop. Let's work on this. I don't want to bring it out yet. And I'm also someone who procrastinates by doing other tasks, less important tasks, but other tasks. So I procrastinate by working, interesting enough. And so as a result, I always feel like I'm working. 
even though there's not the work that needs to be getting done, getting done. And so those are my two procrastination languages. For many people, when it comes to retirement planning, we're just not very confident and comfortable that we're prepared for retirement. And so we put off for a day and a time where we have the mental capacity to be able to tackle such a decision, right? That's something that I've done all the time where I'm like, man, this is a lot of work. And then in my mind, it'll say, Dre, we should do this instead because that's an easy win and you'll feel good. And then we can come back and do this another time. Or I'll sit down and I'll be like, mm, it's only an hour before bed and I need at least two hours on this. So I'll try tomorrow and see if I can start earlier at the right time. But if we procrastinate on retirement thinking, oh, well, well, it's not the perfect time yet, but don't worry, I will use the catch-up provision and then I'll be able to max out my investments because it'll be a better situation later. Or we'll say, well, well, don't worry, I'm going to get rid of this debt or, or I have to take this trip because we only live once or after I get my kids through college, right? There's always something. And then we say, then I will put all of my money towards my retirement. I have learned personally, and I'm going to share this with you that the best way to achieve all of your dreams is to build a consistent process. And I'll put a link to another video where I talk about consistency, but if you could do a little bit each day of something, where even if you put $5 away every single day in your retirement plan, that that's better than waiting for the day that you're able to put $100,000 in your retirement plan. That if you build the investment habit, as you get more money, what do you think you're gonna do with the money? You're going to feed your investment habit. Even if you can only start with $5 a day, a dollar a day, 50 cents a day, it doesn't really matter. Building an investment habit where your money is already in the stock market, your money is already being put toward buying real estate, your money is already being allocated towards buying a business, and then you can put your money away. And then as you get more, you're just going to invest more. Because as you get those small wins early on, which is kind of the number one goal, if you really think about a retirement planner, is you want to make sure that the client feels wins early on almost like gamifying something. If you think of Candy Crush and other games, they want to get those first levels under your belt early, where it's very easy to beat levels one through 10, because when you get to level 110, it gets really hard. And because that's how we all are, you normally want to start by getting people early wins where they can see their money working and they can believe in the process. You can be like, hey, look, this is how it's going. We're able to do this. We're accomplishing our goals. Let's ramp it up. Because for many people, you got to see it to believe it. And so you want to help people see it. I find the common strand amongst most of the retirement reasons is we don't have confidence in what we're doing. We feel that there's something, whether it's fear, uncertainty, doubt, whatever it is, we just don't feel like this is the right time. We're ready. However we interpret that feeling, it really has to do with confidence. We got to be prepared for what's going to happen. And if you're prepared, put yourself in a situation to either win or learn. It either works or works on you is the way that I've heard it put. I listen to Myron Gold and he talks about that sometimes. The last reason saving for retirement can feel impossible is healthcare costs. Healthcare costs, like other costs, tend to go up significantly over time. Whether it is we need surgeries or whether we have to take care of different people, different things. I know my healthcare, when I had a, a job and we had the benefits, that thing would go up 10% some years. And I'd be like, good night. And then I would switch to a high deductible plan and it would still go up significantly. And I'm like, oh my gosh. And unfortunately, and you guys already know the theme, it's the way the system is designed. Because most of us don't know how much we're being charged, where we just pay the deductible and then they charge wherever they want to our insurance company, we think that we don't have to pay that. Well, we do. We actually have to pay all of that because they recalculate the cost of distributing that insurance the next year and then they increase our premium. I remember the first year I quit my corporate job to start working for myself. And I said, you know what? Let me go ahead and not have healthcare insurance because I'll just save the money. I'm a healthy person, nothing happens to me. And then as you know, unexpected expenses happen. I ended up tearing my patella tendon and needed knee surgery. And when I went around to the doctor's office, I would say, hey, I'm a cash patient. And it was almost like they would open up an extra page of the book where they don't tell you that this is how much it costs, but this is how much it really costs. And I remember when I went to get my MRI or my CAT scan, I forget which one it was because it's been a while now. And they said, it's $4,000 to do it here. And I said, I'm a cash patient. And they said, okay. And they took a sticky note, they wrote an address down and they said, go to this address and they will do the MRI for you. And they'll put the result on a disc and then bring the disc back here. They will only charge you $300. I looked around like, did you hear that? Did you, did you hear that? Was that just me? Did, did anyone else hear that? She just told me that they would charge me $300 if I went to this address. And she was like, yeah, that's, that's basically the cash rate. And you would think that that was a one-time thing, but it wasn't. That was what happened everywhere. When I went to get my knee surgery, 
They said, okay, it'll be $42,000 for your knee surgery. And I said, hey, I'm a cash patient. And then they flipped the book, they turned in the page, and it said, oh, if you're a cash patient, it's $2,500. I looked around again like, did you hear that? It went from 42000 to 2500 And so what most of us don't understand is because we're only paying deductibles, we're only paying our max limits, and then these companies charge whatever they want, we think that we're not paying that cost, but we are every year when our rates go up 10, 20%. And again, it's just the way the system is designed. The reason that it feels very difficult to near impossible to save for retirement is because if you play the game the way the system is created, the system is created to make lifelong employees. I tell you guys that all the time, which means that if our plan is to win, we have to play a different game. We have to change the rules. We have to create a process that helps us win in these situations. And I'll put a link where I can go over it in great detail, but the number one factor of self-made millionaires, according to the IRS, is 65% of them have multiple streams of income. They have at least three streams of income. There are seven streams of income as far as ways to make money, and 65% of self-made millionaires have at least three of them. And the top 10% of wealth in the United States owns 90% of the stock market. And we know that there are private funds that are purchasing real estate. We know that there's tons of funds, private equity that purchase small businesses, and that the number one determining factor of your ability to generate enough money for you to be able to leave this rat race is to be able to have money that comes in the rest of your life without you having to work for it. I just wanna thank you always for your time. I appreciate you spending it with me. You honestly could have been anywhere. If you found value in this video, go ahead and like and subscribe so you can continue receiving valuable insights on how to create your own wealth and retirement system so that you can worry less and live more. Until next time, stay safe and enjoy life.